It's been, what, maybe 10 days since the Mavericks ended their season, and yet again, we have ourselves another big story, and once again, it has nothing to do with the actual players or free agency or anything like that, but a very, very questionable circumstance pertaining to the front office. Previously, we had Donnie Nelson criticizing Luka Doncic, making it sound like he is too focused on his own scoring rather than getting his teammates involved. A very laughable setup, although you always have room for improvement. To, to say that this is a major fault in Luka's game is ridiculous. Of all the things you could address, I said at the time I thought that was more so him deflecting on behalf of Kristaps Porzingis because it moves the narrative to the franchise player, Luka, and Donnie Nelson himself, who can take that heat, and it keeps a lot of the attention instead off of Kristaps. That was my theory there. This, this is a different animal. This, as we find out from Tim Cato and Sam Amick of The Athletic, is a potentially very troubling situation here as a quote-unquote shadow GM is potentially creating a rift between the Mavericks' front office and Luka Doncic. A rift... Sources within the organization fear may ultimately affect whether or not Luca wants to remain with the franchise long term. Now, in our exit interviews, we did hear from Luca himself, sheepishly grinning and saying, like, I think you know what I'm going to do this summer, when asked about whether or not he would sign his Supermax contract worth $200 million. Yeah, that's a pretty safe assumption, but we know what today's NBA is. Players sign max deals, and within a year, maybe two, they can still force their way out. Contracts move all the time. Just because you sign a five-year deal doesn't mean that you're going to get five years in that arrangement. So it's something to consider there. But this story is particularly interesting, not just because Mark Cuban immediately commented on the story calling it total bullshit, not just because, thereby, by the way, amplifying the story even more so. But he draws further attention onto this question. And this has to do with a quote-unquote shadow GM, that being uh, Haralbab Volgaris. Now, this is a, a known sports gambler who's been with the Mavericks since 2018, after Luka Doncic was drafted. And he had been somewhat on the Mavericks payroll in the years even prior to that, the couple years prior to that, but he didn't have an official role with the team until 2018. And in that time, he has reportedly gained a lot of clout. Now, there's a lot in this article to really consider here. While the Mavericks say that his role has more to do with advanced analytics and things like that, things pertaining to how they run the offense and their, their insistence on shooting threes at a high capacity, thereby being more efficient in these different metrics, the article goes on to say that he has significant sway with regard to player personnel. That doesn't just mean, hey, I think we should go target this player. A good move that Harlebob is considered is reacquiring Seth Curry a couple summers ago. He is credited with that move in this story, and that was a very good move. Curry had a very good year with Dallas However, he's also credited with the trade that sent Curry out the door for Josh Richardson and a second round pick that became Tyler Bay. So, kind of canceled himself out there. You made the good move and then one year later, pfft, flushed it down the toilet. Not good. But to me, a real disconnect is something that's being glossed over in this story. Yes, we'll talk about the, the concerns of a rift with Luca, obviously, that is the the more profound and sexier angle to this story that's being considered. But it's speculative, even if it's from sources within the organization. It remains, nevertheless, speculative because we don't know Luca's actual thoughts on this. We have one or two little instances. Honestly, there's more you can find between Luca and Rick than there is Luca and uh, Harlebo here, and. I'm going to say his name about 12 different ways until I eventually land on one. Won't know that I got it right, and I'll move on to a different one that's also wrong, but just bear with me. So in this, the thing that's being looked over, I think, that's being overlooked, rather, is on draft night, this past draft, the Mavericks scouting department 
were available in the war room via Zoom. Not surprising, that's how basically everything operated. The problem is that for both of Dallas's first picks, that being Josh Green, that being Tyrell Terry, they were not consulted, and they had major, it doesn't say who, but on one of those picks, they had major disagreements about who Dallas should pick. According to the article, he overrode everyone, didn't even consult them, and made those selections. Now, we know Shadiq Bey, we know uh, Bain as well, two players that were both available when Dallas took Josh Green. Bain almost fell back to him. Maybe that's just a, a missed opportunity trying to play percentages as a notable gambler will do. Maybe. Regardless, it did not work out that way for Dallas, and so they instead have kind of a contentious thing where the, the scouting department is in disbelief that they're not being consulted. To me, this shows real problems within the front office of Dallas and how they operate. There's Not everyone's on the same page. Not everyone's in agreement. And we've seen instances before. Now, this is not Harley Bow here. This is Mark Cuban in the Giannis draft. Donnie Nelson was pounding the table, telling Mark he could not pass on Giannis and Tentacupo. Mark decided he wanted the max salary cap slot available to try and go get Dwight Howard. And so he traded back instead and let Giannis go. Milwaukee practically sprinting up to the podium to take Giannis. And then he trades back yet again after drafting Kelly Olenek in order to get Shane Larkin. This just kind of shows a narrative here where, like, even the basketball minds Dallas does have, they can easily be overrode by you know, some bigger vision, whether it be from the owner or in this case, uh, someone with a lot of input into the personnel. Now, this guy, uh, as it relates to it, also had a lot of sway on player starting lineups. Another big move he's credited with was the trade for DeLon Wright, where Dallas traded back in the draft and acquired a second round pick, which they then flipped to Memphis uh, for DeLon Wright. He insisted DeLon Wright would be a perfect weapon to start alongside Luka Doncic. That experiment lasted about five minutes, about the time it takes to enjoy a cup of coffee, before DeLon Wright was relegated to a reserve player. And by the time the playoffs rolled around last year, he barely saw the floor. He was abysmal. Kind of like Josh Richardson was for Dallas this year. Again, another holler bow move. Not good. Not good. So, in this situation, mul multiple moves he's made in his short tenure have blown up in his face. This says that certain decisions, as it related to the acquisition of Porzingis, as it related to the max contract offered to Porzingis, all these things have to have his stamp of approval. Now, the work here from Tim Cato and Sam Emick are actually good, and I think they're quality journalists here. I know Mark Cuban immediately put the story on blast, calling it total bullshit, saying he wasn't consulted about the story until right before it published. I think this is damage control mode. Why do I think that? Because the Mavericks immediately responded by throwing out this BS story no one was talking about, like, oh, hey, there's a rumor. There's a rumor over here that the Milwaukee Bucks want to want to recruit Rick Carlisle to be the coach. Oh, it, it's a diversion technique. It's trying to take our attention away from this story and throw it like, like a dog watching a biscuit. Little dog treat. Just boop, throw it down the hall. Dog goes running and it's like, whew. All right, we're good now. We don't have to talk about that. We don't have to be under the microscope. I don't, I don't think there's anything to it. Now, I'm not saying that everything in the story is foolproof. We have unnamed sources within the organization, multiple sources at that, and you can still have tension and disagreements in that regard because I've talked repeatedly, even just recently, about the Mavericks brain trust, right? The three-headed brain trust. Mark, Donnie, Rick. Well, this story kind of contends that Harlebo has moved up into and even circumvented that because... Not only is, is player acquisition getting his stamp of approval and his direction, there, there are alle allege alleges? allegations in this story from Tim Cato and Sam Amick that he is essentially setting lineups 
at times based on his analytic models. That, I don't know how Rick would put up with that. I really, really don't. And the only thing I can think, unless Rick is just an old dog that doesn't really want to move again, doesn't want to relocate to chase another job because he knows he's got it made here for as long as he wants to be here at this point, regardless of how recent years have gone post-title. And again, there's a real conversation to be had there. Rick has made the playoffs with Dallas nine times, failed to get out of the first round seven times. One of those times he got to the second round where he lost in five, and then there's the title year. There's a major conversation that should be had there, but that's a different topic. Whether Rick is just content here being where he is, even if he sees this guy kind of somehow circumventing, and this is total speculation just based on what the article lays out kind of how it seems to be painting this picture and my interpretation of it, that he's kind of superseding the power structure here where it's basically you got Mark, you got Harlebo right there as kind of the right-hand guy with the input, and then you got Donnie and Rick somewhere in that next tier. And if that's the case, I really wonder because Donnie has been under a heavy microscope after those Luca comments and based on how he's built the team in recent years. So the fact that this story comes out now kind of feels like, hey, people were saying Donnie has done a terrible job building a roster and it's all his fault. And then, oh wait, now we have this scapegoat over here, even though there's fair points there. There's fair points in the Donnie category too, don't get it twisted. Now we got, oh, here's a scapegoat over here. And now the development the other direction, it's like they're pointing fingers at each other through unnamed sources is what it feels like. And to me, the obvious answer is, yo, uh, if you got a guy who people within your organization are afraid he's causing a rift with Luca, this being because of situations wherein he has sat in his typical courtside seat, typing away on his laptop. And in one instance, in a timeout, he came over to the bench and he was kind of making the like, you know, calm down, calm down gesture to Luca. And Luca, according to the article, basically said, don't fucking tell me to calm down because Luca was upset at the time. We know Luca can be a bit emotional. He's young and he's fiery. He wants to win. Luca didn't take that because it's like, dude, who are you? You weren't a player. You weren't a coach. You weren't a front office person. You're a, you're a sports gambler. Like, you're just here because you made money gambling sports and you insist it's because of some analytical model. So now you got a job here, apparently. And I'm supposed to listen to you? Hell no. Again, a little bit of paraphrasing there. Another instance where Luca got cross with him was in a game against the Knicks, a loss where Dallas was down 10 with about a minute left. Uh, Harlebo left his courtside seat. Luca noticed, and even though Dallas made a run to cut it down, it took about another 7 to 10 possessions before the game wrapped up. And after the game in the locker room, Luca commented to multiple teammates that that guy left because he quit on us. He doesn't believe in us. Luca does not respect this guy, and frankly, he has no reason to respect this guy. The fact that this guy made millions of dollars lost it all, and then made millions again, gambling on sports means nothing to a professional athlete. This guy in the article says he believes he would be a, he wants to be a GM someday for a team, and he believes he would be better than almost any other GM in the league. There is such a massive ego complex here, and the moves he's making and the power he's accumulating, according to the article, is like very troubling, not just because it clearly shows he sucks at it with recent decisions he's made. He's got he's like one for seven, and he's acting like he's batting a thousand. But because he's doing the one thing you don't do, he's ruffling the feathers of the face of the franchise, the franchise cornerstone, the next Dirk. And the article makes that clear. Like it's unreal that you were able to immediately find the next Nowitzki while you still had Nowitzki for at least another minute. That's unbelievable. So the fact that you're in here and you're ruffling feathers, like, what are you doing? What, why do you think that's a good idea? Now, a couple things to consider. Harlebo's contract does end. It expires at the end of this summer. If Dallas is smart, they let it go. They let it go. They don't re-sign him. It's easy. You don't risk upsetting the superstar even in the, I have no question Luke is going to sign that five-year, $200 million contract. I have no question he'll do that. But you don't risk the superstar in any long-term capacity 
for an analytics guy that's not even like he's not your GM. He's not your president of player personnel. He's not your president of basketball operations, as that's what I was essentially trying to say as I made a football title there. You don't risk your franchise's future to keep this guy. This guy. You don't do it. It doesn't make sense to do that. Again, I, I think Tim Cato, especially, is a damn good journalist. The Athletic is not just some sports blog. I think the people who are throwing mud at this story are not taking into consideration the many great years of work under Tim Cato's belt. He's not just some blogger who showed up on the scene and decided he was going to try and ruffle feathers. Now, does the story lean into the Luca angle when there's a bigger conversation around it? I think, I think that's fair, but I also know that comes more so from an editor at that point. So I don't like I don't like the notion that people are trying to discredit the work simply because it's something they don't like, they don't want to hear. But regardless, this speaks to a very dysfunctional, disorganized front office that's not on the same page, that doesn't support the same direction and vision. And that's that perfectly radiates what we've seen on the floor, not just this year, not just last year, the last decade. It all fits. There's a reason this team has been a glorified pile of shit the last 10 years. There's a reason they have not won a playoff series since the 2011 finals. They blew up the title team, decided they were going to go a new direction, trying to move in a new era of basketball, insisting they were the smartest guys in the room and that they, hey, hey, did you read the CBA? Did you read the new CBA? Because I did. All these teams that are spending all this money, they're putting themselves in trouble. The only ones who got screwed by the CBA were Oklahoma City, who actually tried to follow the damn thing. It cost them Harden. That's the only team that you could definitively point to and say they got screwed over. Ma the Mavericks could have kept Tyson Chandler. They should have kept Tyson Chandler. Rick thought he was being smart, getting out ahead of it, because he was afraid of what he saw in Oklahoma City, not realizing that was going to be a threat for one more year before they moved on, because Harden left. So... This is, uh, th this is just absolute dysfunction. I don't know. I trust Donnie's talent evaluation, his ability to see talent. Now, when it comes to player acquisition, again, I really want to know what moves are Donnie and what moves are Harlebo here because this is a very, very problematic thing we're seeing here. Like... If the vision to rewrite the roster with defensive, long, lanky guys who could shoot threes was this guy's decision, and he spearheaded that by moving Seth Curry for Josh Richardson, he needs to be under the microscope for that alone, let alone draft night, let alone ruffling the feathers of Luka. All of that needs to be examined. All of that needs to be examined. I honestly... I don't know that we'll ever know who those sources in the organization are that talked in this article. And it's not in anything we've seen in his character to do this. But it would be interesting. Total speculation here. I'm saying that now. I am totally speculating as I say this. It would be fascinating to me if Harlebo really is kind of injecting himself between Mark, Donnie, and Rick. And it's Rick, for instance, who, like I said earlier, it makes no sense he would let his lineups be set or affected or altered in any way by this guy's analytics. It's interesting to consider the possibility that maybe Rick is one of these sources. Maybe Rick is basically saying, like, you know, I know how to read a room. Again, a thing that comes up in this article, Rick's ability to grow and read a room because of how stringent he used to be when it came to handling the reins from point guards. Rick reading the room and basically saying, you know, people are really upset with how we're running things. I don't like how we're running things either. And a power struggle seems like the worst thing we could have in the most crucial offseason in our franchise's history. So, you know what? I'm going to help raise awareness on this. A story is already being written. I'm going to add a little bit to it and give an idea of just how deep this thing runs. That's fascinating to consider. Now, 
Again, that's my speculation based on what I read in this article. Check it out, Tim Cato's and uh, Sam Emick's article on The Athletic. It's a good read, although it is troubling. Ten days into the season being over, and we are not yet without unnecessary drama. Awesome. Awesome. But we'll get into it more as we find out more. Right now, that's all we really got. So don't forget to drop a like, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.